Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for taking the time to connect with us here at Erwin Mitchell in the next webinar in our series on health inequalities, which has been a wonderful way to bring together our clients, communities and colleagues. I'm Sarah Jones. I'm a senior associate solicitor. I specialise in medical negligence cases based at our London office. And I'm delighted to host today as a proudly queer woman myself who is active in the LGBT plus community, but also and more importantly, as a lawyer who represents patients and families in clinical negligence cases and at inquests, the topics we'll discuss today have been themes that unfortunately I've seen affect many clients throughout my career so far. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Thank you so much to those who have already submitted questions in advance. It is possible to also submit additional questions throughout the session via the Q&A function that you should see on your screen and we will take some time for questions at the end. In case we don't get to your question today, if you want to also pop your email address in there, we'll make sure that you get a response directly after the event. This is being recorded and will be circulated to participants afterwards. And final bit of housekeeping, towards the end of the session, we will post a feedback link and we'd be most grateful if you could just take a couple of minutes to let us have your feedback. So I am delighted to introduce our speaker today, who is Laura Clark. Laura is the Partnership Coordinator for the National LGBT Partnership and works with the health and voluntary sector across England, bringing together services to increase the visibility of LGBT plus health inequalities. In the past year, they have been researching LGBT plus women's sexual and reproductive health, exploring barriers to accessing care and disparities in health outcomes. Laura also delivers sex education and LGBTQIA plus training with a number of organisations, including Brooke, Everyone's Invited, and through her own organisation, My Body and Yours. So I'm delighted to hand over to Laura. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. That was a great introduction. <laughs> um, so, yes, as mentioned, I am a um, LGBTQA plus specialist and then also a sex educator. So I deliver a lot of these trainings to various people, so to healthcare workers, to teachers, um, to anybody that has an interest in breaking down um, inequalities either within health and social care or within other systems such as schools. So I'm really excited to be here today and talk to you all about um, LGBTQI plus health discrimination and medical neg negligence and what that can look like within sort of healthcare settings. Um, so the LGBT partnership for those who aren't aware or don't know um, is a consortium of 40, around 40, LGBT voluntary sector organisations who are not within themselves necessarily health based organisations, but who have come together to um, work collectively to try and reduce health inequalities for the LGBT community. Um, our two uh, leading organisations are LGBT Foundation and LGBT Consortium. And then we have a number of um, amazing other organisations under us. So we've got some bigger organisations such as Stonewall and Mermaid and gendered intelligence and then some smaller organisations as well that perhaps work more locally um, or with smaller or more specific groups of LGBTQ plus people. So for example, older LGBT people or LGBT people of colour. So we really try to be an intersectional um, partnership and organisation and make sure that the work that we're doing is representative of absolutely everybody. Um, the LGBT partnership is also part of the Health and Wellbeing Alliance, which is another consortium. It's like a big spider web with lots of things branching off um but it's like a big spider web and the um health and wellbeing alliance is another consortium of various different partnerships and organizations um who are funded by uh, nhs england and various other sort of government bodies um also with the aim of reducing healthcare inequalities that's just a very sort of brief um overview of the the sort of work that we do um so that being said if i could have the next slide please so just a content warning for today, just um, because we're going to be touching upon some sensitive topics, just be aware that we're going to be talking about things such as suicide, miscarriage and queer phobia. So homophobia, biphobia and transphobia. If at any point you need to, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a bit of a sore throat today as well. So bear with me if I need to <laughs> take a drink or if I'm coughing a little bit. Um, 
so if you need to take some time away from the screen or just need to sort of um, leave the session early, that's absolutely fine. Please just take care of yourselves. These are sort of quite heavy topics and I recognise that there may be people who've been affected by them here today. Next slide, please. So I start all of my sessions with a breakdown of the acronym LGBTQIA+. To some of you, this may seem very basic. Um, to other to, to other people, it may be something that is needed or that you feel that you need a little bit more context on. I just want to make sure that everybody is on the same page um, before we start talking about the issues that affect the community. So I just want to go through this, this breakdown just so that everybody understands the identities that we're talking about here. So um, lesbian uh, is a term that is usually referred to women who are attracted to other women, whether that's sexual attraction or romantic attraction or both. Um, this can include non-binary people as well. Some non-binary people choose to use the word um, lesbian for a number of reasons, um, but typically it's used to refer to women who are attracted to women. Then you have the word gay, which is used for men who are attracted to other men, um, but can also be used as a sort of more umbrella term. So some lesbian people may also use the word gay or even people who um, don't have a monosexual identity. So monosexual meaning that they are just attracted to one gender as opposed to uh, multiple genders. So some people, for example, who may be bi may also use the word gay as sort of an umbrella term to mean not straight. It's worth noting that um, lesbian and gay are also trans inclusive, so trans women may identify with the word lesbian, trans men may identify with the word gay, um, they're all trans inclusive terms. Next we have B, which stands for bisexual or biromantic, um, and these are people who are attracted to um, more than one gender. So historically sort of the word both has been used but now that we recognize that gender exists on a spectrum it's not just for most people a case of being attracted to men and women but rather um, a full spectrum of genders or sometimes to their own gender and other genders that can also be um, a helpful way of describing um, the bi label so bisexual biromantic bisexual meaning sexual attraction to um, people of multiple genders and biromantic meaning romantic attraction and some people can be bisexual and and biromantic or one or the other so for example you could be bisexual um, and be sexually attracted to more than one gender but you could be uh, for example hetero romantic and just attracted to um, uh, the opposite gender or a different gender to your own then there's sort of uh, the, the three that maybe people are more familiar with and when I talk about things that's kind of like the the, that feels like comfortable area and then we start going into the TQIA plus and people maybe are a little bit less sure. Um, so transgender is uh, very much an umbrella term that is used to describe somebody whose gender does not align with the gender or the sex that they were assigned at birth and this is inclusive of non-binary people so sometimes it can be seen as um, sort of like the opposite gender so somebody who was assigned male at birth identified as a woman or somebody who was, uh, who was um, assigned female at birth identifying as a man but it's generally just anybody who doesn't feel that their gender aligns or sits comfortably with the gender that they were assigned at birth so this does include people who may be non-binary or gender fluid and just don't feel that that sort of matches up with with what they were told when they were born. Then you have queer, which is a um, very broad term and another sort of umbrella term that can be used on its own. So some people will just identify as queer as sort of like a non-specific label to say that they are either not heterosexual or that they are not cisgender. So cisgender being the um, opposite to transgender. So cisgender being that you do feel that the sex you were assigned at birth um, is comfortable and is right for you. So some people will use queer just as sort of like an, a non-specific label. Some people will use it alongside other identities. So you could have somebody that identifies as lesbian and also uses the word queer. Um, and generally, I would say um, a rule of thumb with this word is that it's been reclaimed. So you may have heard it as an insult or as a slur, um, but it has been reclaimed by a lot of people within the community and used in a very positive way. But I would say a good rule of thumb is not to refer to anybody as queer unless you know that they use that term for themselves, because for some people within the community, it can still carry quite a lot of um, a lot of hurt and a lot of um, somebody may have been you know, harassed with it or bullied with it in the past and they don't particularly like that word. So if you know somebody uses it to describe 
with themselves, then that is their identity. You can absolutely use it also to refer to them. Um, but if you're not sure, I would just sort of be careful when it comes to this word. Then you have intersex. So intersex um, are people who have um, physical characteristics that are um, sort of a variation of sex characteristics. So the common sort of misconception is that this means that somebody is born with two different sets of genitals. That's not always the case. It's very rarely the case. So intersex people could be born with um, genitals that perhaps don't quite match, um, you know, what, what we would think of as typical male or female genitals. So it it could be somebody who has a much larger clitoris than what would be typical or a much smaller penis than what would be typical and you would see that sort of difference in their in their genitals but for some people who are intersex there's absolutely no way of telling that they're intersex just by looking at them some people can go their whole lives without realizing they're intersex because there can be different um different sort of um changes sort of that are happening within the body so for example it could be that somebody has um, higher levels of testosterone or estrogen than are typical for somebody with the genitals that they have. It could be that somebody has a variation in chromosomes so that they have um, XY chromosomes or, um, or X chromosomes when you would not expect them to based on the genitals that they have. And I don't know about anyone else here. I've never had chromosome testing, so I don't actually know what chromosomes I have. Um, so you may, you may possibly go your whole life without realising that you are intersex. Some people will realise in puberty, perhaps when they don't start their periods and they realise that they don't actually have ovaries, instead they have internal testes. So there are a number of ways that you can um, can be intersex, but it is sort of like a physical, whereas we think of gender as something that we identify with in our heads, in our brains. Intersex is very much something that is sort of like physical um, characteristics on the body. Um, and then you have asexual and aromantic. So asexual and aromantic are people who experience little to no uh, sexual or romantic attraction. That doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have sex. Some people who are asexual won't have sex or won't have relationships, um, but a lot do for a various number of reasons. It's just that sort of lack of sexual or romantic attraction. And some people can be asexual and aromantic, whereas some people will be asexual, but will be romantically attracted to other people, or some people will be um, aromantic romantic but will be sexually attracted to other people. And then we have the plus which is just inclusive of all non-heterosexual and all non-cisgender identities that are included within the letters there. So you have people who may identify as pansexual or as gender fluid or a various other wonderful uh, concoction of uh, sexualities and genders and that is all included in that in that plus symbol. So I appreciate that was quite rambly and that was quite a long um, explanation, but I do think, so, think it's important that we have sort of like a base level of understanding. And if you're still, if you'd like more clarification on any of these terms, you can go on um, the Stonewall website. They have a great glossary of terms there where you can go and explore that a little bit further. If you just feel like you need to sort of brush up your knowledge a little bit on sort of like base LGBT identities. But I do think it's important moving forward now that we also sort of have this, that same level of knowledge there. Can I get the next slide, please? OK, so um, here's what I'm here to talk to you about today, which is health outcomes and the health disparities that LGBTQIA plus people face and experience. So we have some sort of um, stats on the screen, so I'll just read those out to you now. So half of LGBT people, uh, so 52 percent, said that they have experienced depression in the last year, with another 10 percent saying that they think they may have experienced depression. Half of non-binary people and almost half of trans people who uh, have had suicidal thoughts in the past year compared to 31% of LGB people who aren't trans. 12% of trans people made an attempt to take their own life in the last year compared to 2% of cis LGB people. So we're talking about um, health disparities within the community. Mental health is a really um, significant conversation and there are usually very significant differences in the way that um, mental health issues affect LGBTQ plus people compared to cisgender heterosexual people. We see that um, suicidal ideation and also self-harm, also things like eating disorders and addiction are much higher within the LGBT community more generally and actually can be higher depending on how you identify within that acronym. So for example, 
uh, people who are bisexual are far more likely to experience mental health conditions than gay and lesbian people who are also far more likely to experience it than um, heterosexual cisgender people. So depending on your identity, you may have a higher risk of um, experiencing difficulties with your mental health. But also, it doesn't just affect um, mental health, there's also physical health um, issues and disparities that people experience. So lesbian and bisexual women have higher rates of cardiovascular disease than straight women. And I'll talk a little bit more about some sort of like physical health disparities a bit later on in the presentation as well. Um, but it's really worth noting that it's not just mental health that is affecting people. There are very much physical health conditions um, of which LGBT people are disproportionately impacted by. Can I have the next slide, please? So why is this happening? Why are people um, who are queer or LGBT experiencing worse health outcomes pretty much across the board? Well, one of the theories for this is minority stress. So minority stress refers to additional stress that members of marginalised groups experience because of prejudice and discrimination that they face. The experience of minority stress is in addition to general stress. So we all experience general stress, whether that's, you know, um, health issues or whether that's money worries or just sort of like day to day. <laughs> managing a household and a family. Um, so we all experience sort of those general things that, you know, cause us stress and may make us um, feel that, you know, we, we need some help or support. And obviously, whether you are heterosexual, cisgender or whether you're LGBT, you're going to experience those sort of like everyday stresses. However, minority stress is in addition to that and can lead to poor health outcomes compared to individuals who do not experience minority stress. So, for example, um, minority stress for perhaps someone who is trans might look like not being able to leave the house dressed in the way that they want to dress without feeling that they are going to get stares, they're going to get looked at, they're going to get people whispering about them or in the more extreme examples that they're going to get attacked or even killed just for being, you know, themselves and the way that they are dressing that the way that they would like to dress. So it's very much sort of trying to navigate life um, while having this sort of like identity that makes you more prone to um, e well either danger or harm or just sort of like inappropriate comments or people being invasive. Within healthcare, this could look like you know if you've um, if you've been to see a doctor previously and you've had some inappropriate comments about your sexual orientation, perhaps part of your minority stress might be the next time you're trying to book a doctor, which I'm sure all of us can relate to. It's very stressful trying to book a doctor's appointment anyway at the moment. Um, but it might look like, OK, not only do they then have the, the stress that we all do of booking a doctor's appointment, but actually there is a specific doctor that they are trying to avoid. And it may be that they have to wait longer for an appointment because the only doctor that is available is the doctor that they have had a negative experience with in the past. So that would be that minority stress that doesn't necessarily affect all of us, um, but that could lead to poor health outcomes because somebody is waiting longer for an appointment or just that their mental health is suffering because they've been to see a professional and actually had a negative experience with that where they have been discriminated against. Can I have the next slide please? Um, so discrimination in healthcare as I just mentioned there are a number of ways that this can manifest. So according to the Stonewall 2018 Health in Britain report one in eight LGBT people have experienced some form of unequal treatment from healthcare staff due to their LGBT status um, and a third of trans people have experienced unequal treatment so this does rise very drastically if you are trans or non-binary. One in four LGBT people have experienced inappropriate curiosity from healthcare staff because they're LGBT. Half of trans people and more than a third of non-binary people have experienced inappropriate curiosity. So what we mean by inappropriate curiosity is um, doctors or medical professionals asking questions um, for their own curiosity, their own um, 
um, self-interest rather than for the needs of the patient. So, for example, if you were um, going to a sexual health clinic, it could be, you know, it, you probably would be asked about things like your sexual history or about your genitals, things that are perhaps a little bit more invasive because that's what you're there for and they need that the information in order to get an idea of what your health looks like. If you're going to your GP because you'd been uh, having pains in your ankle, it's very unlikely that they would need to know information about your sexual history or about your genitals. However, for a lot of LGBT people, um, the doctors or the medical professionals that they are going to haven't necessarily um, spoken or interacted with LGBT people before. They see someone in front of them who is LGBT and they see that as an opportunity to sort of answer all of their uh, personal questions of which they're curious about the identities and the activities and lifestyles of LGBTQ plus people. And obviously it's important for us to be curious and to learn and we should want to learn more about LGBT people and their experiences and their identities. But there's a time and place for that. You can attend a training. You, you know, most people have Google on their phone or on their laptop. You can do that research yourself. But if you're going to an appointment because you've hurt your ankle, you're not necessarily going to want to ask loads of really invasive and uh, answer um, invasive and personal questions um, when you know that that's not relevant to your care and it can be really othering as well. Um, and one in four LGBT people said that they've experienced a lack of understanding of specific lesbian, gay and by health needs by healthcare staff. So there's something that I always say, which is that it's not enough to be accepting. You also have to be informed. There's a lot of healthcare professionals who absolutely have the, you know, everyone's best interests at heart. And if you ask them, they would say, oh, no, I completely support the LGBT community. I'm really accepting of everybody. But actually, if you don't have the knowledge and the information of the people that you're treating, you could inadvertently be giving them unequal treatment. So, for example, um, if you were, in theory, a GP who was like, yeah, I'm absolutely accepting with everybody, but then somebody who was trans came to you to ask about gender affirming care and you had absolutely no idea, you may then need to send them elsewhere. You may give them the wrong information. So the fact that you're accepting doesn't necessarily mean that that trans person is going to get the treatment that they need and that they deserve. Um, so it's really important that the medical professionals that LGBT people are seeing are clued in on their identities and have sort of just like a basic level of understanding of the types of um, inequalities and also experiences that they may be having. Next slide, please. So one in 10 LGBT people have been outed without their consent by healthcare staff or in front uh, in front of other staff or patients. So being outed is having your sexual orientation or your gender identity hold to other people without your consent. Um, so, you know, we're very selective with the people that we come out to. We usually come out to people who we deem to be safe people or supportive people. Um, and it's very much on our sort of terms and our conditions. So nobody should be sharing information of anybody's identity without their consent. More than one in four trans people have been outed without their consent, compared to 7% of LGBT people who aren't trans. Uh, similarly, 15% of LGBT disabled people have experienced this. The reason that this is really damaging and really harmful is because you could be outing somebody to another person who has really harmful or prejudiced views towards LGBT people. Once that information is out there, it could be that somebody's family finds out. It could even result in them being made homeless or sort of being separated from their family or even them getting attacked or killed. And I know that sounds really, really extreme, but that has happened before because people have um, had their sexual orientation or gender identity shared without their consent. One in five trans people have been pressured to access services uh, to suppress their gender identity when accessing healthcare services, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, but any um, service that acts to suppress your identity, your LGBT identity is a form of conversion therapy. Okay. And one in seven LGBT people have avoided treatment um, for fear of discrimination because they're LGBT. And obviously, if you have something wrong with you, if you're not feeling well, whether that's um, you know a mental health issue or a physical health issue, if you're avoiding treatment, the high likelihood that that is going to get worse and then result in the, the worse health outcomes that we talked about earlier. Next slide, please. 
So conversion therapy. So conversion therapy, I think for most of us, um, so first of all, conversion therapy is any attempt to change somebody's sexual orientation or gender identity. And usually this manifests as trying to turn somebody straight or turn somebody cisgender. So trying to um, get rid of their LGBT identity. And I think when a lot of people think of conversion therapy, they think of sort of this very stereotypical somebody being sent away to a conversion camp, maybe very religious, maybe a young person being sent away in order to sort of work on themselves and then coming back and, um, you know, that identity being removed or cured. But actually, it can be a lot more insidious than that. So Stonewall defines conversion therapy as any form of treatment or psychotherapy which aims to change the person's sexual orientation or to suppress a person's gender identity. It's based on an assumption that being lesbian, gay, bi or trans is a mental illness that can be cured. So these therapies are both unethical and harmful. They don't work, you know, in the in the vast majority of cases, um, people will still identify as LGBT even after they've undergone this awful conversion therapy. Um, and they're really, really harmful. They're a way of shaming somebody for their identity. Um, and as I mentioned, as a lot of people will have this more stereotypical view of conversion therapy, it can be more insidious than we realise. Conversion therapy can occur in any healthcare setting and can come from any healthcare worker, from GPs to therapists. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So what does conversion therapy look like within a healthcare setting? So we recently did some research into bi plus health inequalities, and these were some of the quotes that came from that research that we did. So healthcare professionals have tried to convince me that I was actually a closeted gay man instead of being actually bisexual. So this is very common with bisexual people being told that they have to pick a side and that their identity as it is isn't valid. They either have to be gay or straight. Um, and this is a, a form of biphobia and a form of monosexism. So this idea that your sexuality is only valid if you are attracted to only one other gender. And an example of how people can um, be completely accepting towards gay and lesbian people, but actually when it comes to bi plus people, bisexual, biromantic people, people that's where their prejudice sort of kicks in and their discrimination kicks in because they're not necessarily homophobic but they are biphobic. I've had therapists telling me you need to pick one. Um, when I was a teenager a psychotherapist thought it was appropriate to state their opinion that I would be better off being a lesbian because penetrative sex would be would probably be difficult for me. So just an example of um, this idea that you can pick your sexual orientation or you can pick your gender identity when that absolutely isn't the case it's just something that that is and um, gender and sexuality can evolve over the, over time um, and do evolve over time for, for some people but but it can't be actively changed. So conversion therapy is really harmful because in a lot of these cases, what we saw with this research is that once this has ha had happened to people, they avoided going back to that treatment. So if they were seeing a therapist for their mental health, as soon as the therapist said something that sort of indicated that they were trying to sway them one way or another, they stopped going to that therapist and also stopped going to any therapist, meaning that their mental health declined. And that is possibly one of the reasons why mental health is so much worse in bi plus people. Next slide, please. So there's also a lot of misinformation. So I talked um, a little bit earlier about this idea that you have to be accepting, but you also have to be informed and understand what you're talking about when you are treating LGBTQ plus people. So lesbian and bisexual women who have sex with women are frequently misinformed that they do not need a cervical screening or a smear test as they're not having penetrative sex with somebody with a penis. So there's this idea that HPV, um, which is a virus that can uh, cause cervical cancer and, and lead on to other cancers. Um, this, this idea that it can only be passed on if you're having sex with somebody with a penis, which absolutely isn't true. It can be passed on by other means. It can be passed on on hands or fingers, or if you're sharing sex toys with another person, it could also be passed on there. So even if you've never had sex with somebody with a penis and you yourself have a vagina, there's still a likelihood that you could get HPV. But unfortunately, this is not what women who are having sex with women are being told. They're being told, oh, if you've never had sex with somebody with a penis, realistically, you're probably fine. You don't need to come in for the cervical screening or they're actively being turned away. They go into the doctor with their letter and say, got my appointment. And they're being told, oh, no, you can go home. You don't need it because of your um, sexual history. 
as a result of this, lesbian and bisexual women are up to 10 times less likely to have had a cervical screening in the past three years than heterosexual women. Um, so a lot more avoidance of healthcare there. And also prevalence of all cancers, including cervical cancer, are higher in lesbians. So it's just 4.4% and bi women 4.2% uh, compared to heterosexual women, three, uh, which is 3.6%. So as you can see here, that uh, misinformation is having a very drastic knock on effect. It's leading to people avoiding accessing care. And then when we avoid accessing care, perhaps there is a higher chance of us uh, not getting the treatment that we need when we do have certain healthcare conditions. Next slide, please. So when we talk about avoiding care, um, this is particularly prevalent for trans and non-binary people. So we did some research recently um, into trans experiences of pregnancy and maternity services, where we talked to trans men and non-binary people who have been pregnant um, recently. I believe it was in the last five years, um, but I might be wrong with that. So the report's called the Items Report, Improving Trans Experiences of Maternity Services. And what we found was that trans and non-binary people's experiences of perinatal care are consistently worse, consistently worse across the board compared to cis women. So this is reflected in the proportion of trans and non-binary birthing parents who didn't access any perinatal care during pregnancy. So um, in the general population, around 2.1% of, of pregnant people will avoid accessing any care. So any care means um, usually attending the doctor when you first get pregnant. It means, um, you know, going for scans and tests. It also means giving birth in, you know, a medical setting in a hospital. So that's usually only 2.1%. But for trans and non-binary people, it rose very drastically to 30%. So what you have is trans and non-binary people who are avoiding accessing any type of care when they're pregnant, from scans to giving birth in a hospital, often due to fear that they will be discriminated against or that they're going to be going into a very heavily gendered service and that that could cause gender dysphoria. 54% of trans and non-binary respondents who free birth, so free birth to being, um, you, you know, not necessarily giving birth from, from home, so giving birth from home, they still have a midwife there, um, but people who have given birth outside of a medical setting, so often a home birth, but with no medical professionals there. So like a home birth, but without a midwife or any um, medical support. So 54% of trans and non-binary respondents who free birth would have found it helpful to have a midwife to support them during labour and giving birth. So it's not necessarily that um, trans and non-binary people don't think that it would be helpful or don't think that it would be safer for them to have a midwife there. Perhaps there are other reasons at play, such as that fear of sort of discrimination or um, the fear of being misgendered or spoken down to, any number of reasons that they could be avoiding that care. Next slide, please. There's also lots of cases of um, people, medical professionals making assumptions when it comes to um, trans and non-binary people and LGBT people more generally, to be honest, but specifically trans and non-binary people. So in a 2019 um, to 2022 report, the Care Quality Commission highlighted a case where a pregnant trans man had been irradiated. So this is somebody who was assigned female at birth, um, had a uterus and uh, got pregnant, um, but identified as a man. So a pregnant trans man had been irradiated during a CT scan because he was not asked about the possibility of pregnancy. Uh, they made an action for employers to make sure that procedures in imaging and radiotherapy departments are inclusive of transgender and non-binary patients, including the procedure for making pregnancy inquiries. So what this uh, resulted in is people within a certain age group, so people who may have a risk of being pregnant, um, so age 12 to 55, to be asked what sex they were registered at birth. If they answered female, despite whatever their current gender identity is, so man, woman, non-binary, um, they were asked what um, sex were you assigned at birth. If they said female, then further questions would be asked about the risk of pregnancy. So this was uh, proposed to be asked to absolutely everybody who entered the service that on your form, it would be asked what sex were you assigned at birth. And if you ticked female, you would be asked, could there be a risk that you could be pregnant? Just to avoid any fetuses unnecessarily being irradiated again, obviously this is a really horrible circumstance um, that could have been avoided just by asking if there was any risk of pregnancy and just that one very small question um, could, have, could have meant that better care could be provided and safer care could be provided. Um, can I have the next slide please? 
So unfortunately, as uh, is the case with a lot of trans and non-binary inclusivity proposals, there was a huge pushback um, towards this um, within the sort of mainstream press. People were saying that it was absolutely ridiculous that we were asking men if they were pregnant before they went to get a, a scan. So you can see some of the headlights there. NHS is asking men if they're pregnant before taking scans with pregnant in uh, big bold letters. Uh, hospital is asking men if they're pregnant before taking scans as it's the least intrusive way to be safe. Uh, it doesn't make sense to ask men if they're pregnant before a scan, so it's health sec true. So you can see that there was a massive pushback to this. People were really insulted. There were people claiming that if you were a man who perhaps, uh, so a cisgender man who was going for a scan because you had, um, say, cancer for some reason, that actually being asked this question could be really distressing or really confusing when actually it's just a case of you receive a form that just asks, is there a risk that you could be pregnant? And if there isn't, you just tick no, because I was assigned male at birth, so there's no risk there. Um, so in reality, this was just a really, really, really small step that was also already being taken in a lot of circumstances. So I, um, my brother personally received a lot of healthcare when he was younger. He went through chemotherapy when he was six. And um, I was speaking to my mum about this a while ago and she was saying, oh, I remember, you know, on forms that I had to fill in for him. It asked if there was a risk that he could be pregnant. And I always just ticked no, because he's a six year old cis male child. Um, so this is something that's already been happening in a lot of cases, but because there's this um, sort of moral panic surrounding trans and non-binary people, there was just a huge pushback to it. People saying that it'd be confusing, people saying that it would be distressing to people when in actuality, it was just a case of ticking a box on a form um, to make sure that the, you know, that, that trans people are included when we're talking about pregnancy and, you know, radiotherapy or scans or anything like that. Um, next slide, please. So that sort of brings me to the end of, of my presentation. We've sort of got around 20 minutes now, I think, roughly, for questions. So, um, yeah, I welcome all the questions. Thank you for, for listening to me drone on for a while. <laughs> um, and yeah, let me know if there's anything you need me to answer. Thanks so much, Laura. Thank you. That was really interesting and informative and um, just so clear and, and obviously just such such important issues. Um, we ha did have a couple of questions in advance, actually. So, um, yeah. Um, but if anybody else has them, please feel free to pop them in the in the Q&A chat. Um, so we had a question from Joe Naylor at Talk Through. Um, thank you, Joe. Um, just asking about health inequalities in relation to pregnancy and maternity services. I know you touched on it mm -hmm. briefly there, Laura. Yeah, so I mean, obviously we touched upon that a little bit um, at the end. I would say that, um, I mean, first of all, I'll talk about, um, I mean, well, across the board, it's great if we're not making assumptions and we're asking people the questions that we need to ask. So we're not assuming anybody's gender and that we're also not assuming anybody's partner. But I'll talk specifically about um, women who may be in relationships with other women and having, um, you know, uh, children as lesbian parents. There's a lot of instances where people are having to fight to have their female partner actually recognized at any point and that can um that can be something um as simple i say as simple it's still very harmful but that could be as simple as um, being assumed that the person you've brought with you is your friend or your sister there's lots of instances of pregnant women going to the doctor and then saying oh i'm really sorry your friend will have to wait outside it's partners only um when actually that is their partner <laughs> and it would only take just a second to ask that question to say oh who have you brought with you today to actually understand what that relationship is and just to be aware it's just sort of like a basic awareness that LGBT people exist and are probably using your service so I think um it's really important because a lot of our services are very heteronormative and very cis normative in that we uh, healthcare professionals assume that the people that they are seeing are going to be straight and cisgender when obviously that isn't the case for a lot of people so I think it starts with training for healthcare professionals in, in all areas of, of health and medicine, training on LGBT identity, sort of such as this training today, um, just to be aware of the experiences of people who may be accessing their services, and then also asking questions. So this is different to that sort of inappropriate curiosity that we talked about before, but just something as simple as saying, oh, what pronouns do you use? Or could you fill in this form and let me know sort of like your gender or how you'd like to be referred to, or um, who, who is your partner? 
partner instead of do you have a husband or a wife? Just really neutralizing that language. And I think the same for trans and non-binary people who are accessing maternity services. A lot of the time, there's so much unnecessary gendering around maternity services. And yes, we recognize the vast, vast, vast majority of people that give birth are cisgender women. That is fine. That's absolutely fine. No one's trying to deny that. That is just the case. Um, but in a lot of cases, there's just so many things within maternity services that are unnecessarily gendered. So, for example, it could be that you go into a maternity service and you see a sign that says, uh, ladies, please take a seat. And um, that ladies is just unnecessary. It could just be, please take a seat or, um, you know, everyone, please take a seat. Um, it just doesn't need to be that gendered. And to remove that is not to deny that, you know, the vast majority of people that attend these services are women. It's just to recognise that not everybody who does is going to be a woman or identify as a woman. And therefore, if we can create a more inclusive space and a more sort of just like blanket space that includes everybody then perhaps people will feel more confident accessing maternity services i think it's also really important um, i think the first step is training and recognizing just how harmful these small things that we don't necessarily think twice about can be so i think training is is first and foremost what a lot of medical professionals need to to undergo and to to experience um but i think then it it becomes more difficult when we're trying to break down our own prejudices and we're trying to recognize okay if we have this view or this idea that um, trans people who give birth are in some way strange or other then you know ultimately are we going to be providing them with the best care that we can so i think it comes from really trying to do that work within yourself and break down okay well why do i feel this way and it is challenging no one's saying that this is a quick fix um, but I think that training is is vital and is the first the first instance. And I think also just not making assumptions and asking questions and being as inclusive as you can in the questions that you ask. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, we've also had a question from Jackie Fenimore at the Christie. I love this question. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Jackie. Um, Jackie asks, how can we encourage people from the LGBTQIA plus community to feel less isolated when diagnosed with cancer? It's a really good question because I know that regardless of identity, there is a, a, a chance that you could be, you could feel isolated um, if you're diagnosed with something as serious as cancer. There's, um, so this cancer isn't necessarily my specialty, but there is an organisation called Live Through This um, who are amazing and they are specifically an LGBT plus cancer organisation. And I know the, the, the founder of that charity very well and we work with them quite a lot. And they're fantastic in recognising, um, I think, you know, if, you, if you're diagnosed with it, it comes back to this minority stress. Obviously, being diagnosed with cancer for anybody is going to be hugely stressful and hugely upsetting. But then perhaps further isolation could come from having that LGBT identity and having to navigate being LGBT within, you know, um, hospital appointments or within cancer settings. So um, what um, what live through this do is they really take the identity of the person into consideration and they recognize that the challenges and the, and the barriers that you may face particularly for example if you're trans or non-binary you know there's a lot of instances of people not being you know because their their gender marker on their form says um male for example they're not necessarily being called in for um you know cervical screenings or for treatments that um are for people who have been assigned female at birth because this is male on their records but actually those services and those treatments are relevant to them so what live through this do is they support people who do have a cancer diagnosis and may experience additional barriers because they're lgbt and they also sort of can help you to advocate for getting the care that you need um that otherwise may sort of be pushed under the rug because of either you know clerical errors and the way that we register gender um but yeah i highly recommend going to their website it's live through this i think it's live through this.org.uk but if you google live through this lgbt um you'll almost definitely get it but um yes highly recommend them brilliant thanks laura so if there's no further questions then I would like to thank everybody it's for joining us today. It's been uh, it's been a privilege to have so many of you with us. And um, if you do have any further questions, 
then um, hopefully on the next slide you should be able to see our contact details um, but also if you have a look at our website erwinmitchell.com um, there's lots of other website uh, webinars on the archive there and you can uh, keep in touch with us <clears throat> and follow us for any further legal updates or future webinars um, hopefully you should also have the link to the to the feedback um, so if you get a chance to to provide us with some feedback from today, we'd be most grateful. OK, so um, we can let everybody enjoy the rest of their lunch break and just thanks again so much to Laura Clark. Thank you for having me as well. It was really lovely. Thanks. <laughs>